What are the different types of elves? And are there any real big differences between the Noldor and the Teleri, Sindar and Sylvan? Let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel, we break down the best in fantasy books and TV shows. The Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire, The Witcher and much more. If you like the sound of that, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. Although most of the TV and film adaptations of Tolkien's work have tended to present elves as all rather similar, when you dig into Tolkien's deeper legendarium you will find that there are many, many different types of elves with different names and different backgrounds, strengths and weaknesses, some of which are more obvious than others. In this video we will break down all of that, but we should probably start by emphasising what connected them all. Elves and men were created directly by Iluvatar, the one god of Tolkien's universe, without any demiurgic mediation by the Valar, as was the case with dwarves and Ents, for example, and were known as the children of Iluvatar. And the elves emerged first, before humans in Middle-earth, and as well as being first, they were different. This is not just in the pointiness of their ears, but rather the different nature of their souls and how those relate to their bodies and the world as a whole. Whereas the soul of a man is a visitor upon the earth, leaving it after a brief time, the soul of an elf is tied to Arda, the world, bound to it for as long as the earth endures. In modern parlance, their souls were eternal, which is both why they were all so long-lived and why their natural home, where their souls were drawn to, was the Undying Lands. Middle-earth, with its swift-changing seasons and cycle of life and death, was for the humans. And when the elves first woke up, they were all one people, and the name they had for themselves was Quendi, originally meaning speaker, as when they explored the world a little, they found that they were the only creatures who spoke, although this meaning shifted later to more broadly mean people. According to the Quivieniana, the elvish fairy tale they told each other about their beginnings, the first generation of elves woke up in a particular order. In three groups, basically, and these three groups or clans eventually settled on names for themselves, the Vanyar, Noldor and Lindar, reflecting prominent aspects about each. Vanyar meant fair, primarily in the sense of pale, with the secondary sense of beautiful later arising also. This was in reference to the predominance of golden blonde hair among them. Noldor meant wise or learned, they were sometimes referred to as the Deep Elves. In Tolkien's earlier writings he called them the Gnomes, and aside from diminutive stature or beards, many of the popular tropes surrounding Gnomes in, say, Dungeons and Dragons or Warcraft were applicable to Tolkien's Noldor, particularly their intelligence and accomplishments as artificers. The name Lindar referred to melody, such as music or the motion of waves and water. They allegedly sang before they even spoke, found bathing in a waterfall. At which point the Valar found all of the elves and basically summoned them westwards. This was far back in time, well before the First Age, and led to the first great break in the elves, because not all of the elves wanted to go west. Why should they? This was their home, and who were the Valar to tell them to leave? Anyway, the great journey westwards is what resulted in the next major division among the elves. About two-thirds elected to follow Orome into the west, while a third refused the summons, including tellingly the entire first generation. Orome had originally referred to all elves as Eldar, the people of the stars, but that name was then applied only to those who had set forth on the great journey with him, regardless of whether they reached their destination or not. Those who had refused were called Avari, the refusers, though they called themselves the seniors, because among them were all of the 144 first elves. Later, there would be another way of describing these two groups. Those who desired to see the light of Valinor named themselves the Calaquendi, light elves. They coined their opponents, who did not wish to go, the Moriquendi, dark elves. These terms were primarily in reference to actual light and darkness, but from the first they also carried moral connotations. As far as the Calaquendi were concerned, and let's not forget they wrote most of the histories we've read, 
particularly with the benefit of hindsight, the Moriquendi were refusing a summons from the Valar. Moreover, we're told that the dark element in their name may have referred to the glooms and the clouds dimming the stars during the War of the Valar and Melkor, so that the term from the beginning had a tinge of scorn, implying that such folk were not averse to the shadows of Melkor upon Middle-earth. The terms Calaquendi and Moriquendi later took on a more strict definition of whether an elf had seen the light of the two trees in Valinor, but even then the term was not merely descriptive, but sometimes harshly judgmental of someone's character, the equivalent of an ethnic slur. Remember, the light of the two trees was pure and holy light, so having not seen it was, in the eyes of some, a clear indicator of moral character. Hence, calling someone a Moriquendi or Dark Elf was basically an insult. We see this in the Silmarillion when Caranthia, one of the Noldor elves and a Calaquendi, insults the mighty king Thingol by calling him a Dark Elf. Let not the sons of Finarfin run hither and thither with their tails to this Dark Elf in his caves. Ouch. The irony here, of course, is that although Thingol may have ruled over Moriquendi, he himself was actually a Calaquendi. He had seen the light of the two trees. And although Caranthir is a Calaquendi, he isn't exactly the most morally upright character in the story. He acts as if he hadn't seen the light of the two trees. More broadly, though, the term Eldar to refer to a noble elf and dark elf to refer to an elf of less noble temperament have made their way into the wider generic fantasy lexicon. This is their origin, a distinction between those elves who obeyed the injunction to head west to enjoy the light of the two trees of Valinor and those who did not. And if truth be told, it is just as much a bit of elf trash talk as it is a technical definition at which point the nomenclature starts getting even more nuanced and interwoven, because following the sundering, the moment back in the mists of time when most elves headed west but some stayed behind, those who stayed, the Avari, the refusers, did not stay still. Many thousands of years passed and new generations were born and some eventually migrated westwards to the vales of Anduin, Eridor, and even into Beleriand. The Avari, it should also be noticed, did not think of themselves as inferior to the Eldar in any way. Indeed, they considered the Eldar to be deserters, and only themselves to be the true continuation of the elves. As a result, the tribes that they eventually formed into each seemed to have called themselves a name directly derived from the word Quendi, the very first name the elves gave themselves. Hence the tribes of the Kindi, Quind, Hwenti, Windan, Kinlai, and Penny. These don't individually play a huge role in Tolkien's world, but you just know how much fun the linguist must have had working through how elves' self-perceptions must have played into their evolution of self-nomenclature. But, as I said, this is when it gets a bit messy. Because as the number of elves grew over time, their groupings split and reformed and split again. And what follows can be boiled down to the fact that any given elf can be described as being a part of several different groups, depending on which initial tribe they or their ancestors were in, whether they had personally seen the light of the two trees, which group they were in now, and so on. Let's return to that initial split between those elves who answered the summons to go west and those who didn't. As we've seen, some of those Avari who stayed, or their descendants, did end up going westwards anyway, just because they wanted to, not because they had been summoned anywhere. And just as some of the Avari went west, so too some of the Eldar turned aside from their summons or turned back. The first of these were from the Teleri, the hindmost, the name given to the Lindar who started the great journey, as they were always at the rear of the march. One among them, Lenwe, refused to chance the Misty Mountains, which at the time were far more formidable. Those who forsook the way westwards to follow him were then called the Nandor, those who go back. They did not return east, however, instead turning south down the Anduin, where some of the Avari would soon be. 
Lenwei's son, Denethor, obviously this is a very different Denethor to the one we know in The Lord of the Rings, much later led another westward separate migration into Beleriand. They dwelt in Osiriand, the region just west of the Blue Mountains. This region was later named Linden, etymologically related to the tribal name Lindar. Following the death of Denethor, in the First Battle of Beleriand, the surviving members of this clan became known as the Lyquendi, the Green Elves, after their camouflaged clothing that blended in with the woodlands of Osiriand. The next division came at the end of that great march west. The Teleri were still losing people at the back of the column, so to speak, but the Vanyar and Noldor came to the shores of the sea. Then Ulmo brought the Vanyar and Noldor over the sea to a man on a moving island, for want of a better phrase. The Teleri then lost their leader, who became known as Thingol, who became enchanted by the magic and beauty of Melian the Maya, becoming lost in her eyes for literally years. Their king missing, some of the Teleri, having reached the shore, elected to stay behind in search for him. But others crowned his brother Olwe and went on anyway to wait upon the shores for Ulmo to return for them. While there, Osser the Maya convinced some of them to stay on the beaches of Beleriand rather than to cross to Amman, and they also remained behind when Ulmo came to ferry the Teleri. So the Teleri were basically all over the place, and each of their small subgroups then gained a different name. Those Eldar who did make it all the way over to Amman, despite the setback, were called the Amanyar, those of Amman. This included all of the Vanyar and the Noldor, as well as the Falmari, the Sea Elves. The Sea Elves are basically the Teleri who did make it, and when they got there they decided they actually didn't want to go onto the mainland after all that, they liked the sea too much. Those Eldar who set off on the Great Migration westwards but didn't make it all the way were then called the Umanyar, those not of Amman. This included Teleri, then Nandor, those who turned back, and Sindar. Sindar was a name given to them millennia later, before which they had no need for a word differentiating themselves from others, being the only ones in their part of Beleriand for a long time. They did, however, distinguish between the peoples living in different regions of Beleriand. The Lathrim, people of the Fence, were those dwelling in Doriath, the land of the Fence. They originally had been those who lingered to look for their king when he fell under the spell of Melian the Maya, which meant that they literally missed the boat to a man, so they called themselves the Eglath, the Forsaken People. Those whom Ossa had convinced to stay behind because they dwelt in Phalas were named the Phalathrim. They longed for a man, but loved the shores and coasts of Middle-earth too much. Chief among them that we know is Círdan, the shipwright. Those who migrated beyond Beleriand to a region of cooler climate and greyer skies and the mists of the north, cladding themselves in grey to blend into such surroundings, were called the Mithrim, the Grey Folk. These were the first elves whom the exiles came across when they returned to Beleriand, and it was probably because of them that the Noldor began referring to all of its inhabitants as Sindar, Grey Elves. The name stuck for two reasons. All of the Sindar acknowledged the overlordship of Thingol, which means grey mantle. These elves in western Middle-earth were also grey in that they stood in the middle between the light elves, the Eldar, and the dark elves, both geographically and spiritually. Though they had not seen the light of a man like their kin to the west, neither were they completely ignorant of it, thanks to Melian dwelling among them and Thingol ruling them. They and their ancestors had set off westwards, but for various reasons, noble and ignoble, they had not made it all the way. Because of this, men classified the Sindar as Middle Elves, not noble High Eldar, but also not Dark Elves. We know a lot of the Sindar in The Lord of the Rings. Thranduil and his son Legolas, as well as Celeborn, were Sindar. Things stayed roughly that way for a while. But the next divisions came after the flight of the Noldor from the Undying Lands. Most, but not all, of the Noldor headed back to Middle-earth, following Feanor's lead. They sometimes called themselves the Exiled Noldor, which is a bit of a stretch as it was very much a self-imposed exile, but more often simply the Noldor, since they represented the majority of the tribe. 
New elf kinds began to arise at this time, as the different kinds of elves then mixed. Eldar returning from the west, the Sindar in the middle, who had set off for the west but not made it, and even sometimes the occasional Avari, dark elf, who had not set off at all, but ended up heading westwards anyway. An example here are the Gondolindrim, the people of the hidden realm of Gondolin, who were a mixture of Sindar and Noldor. This was a common occurrence throughout the First Age and later, as the previous trend of elves breaking up into increasingly smaller divisions reversed, with many mixing together to create new peoples. This was accelerated following the sinking of Beleriand at the end of the First Age. Many surviving elves migrated east, mingling with the previous inhabitants there to form new peoples. Though the original inhabitants of the Linden were called the Lyquendi, a majority of Noldor and some Sindar settled around the newly formed Gulf of Loon. These included Kiradan, a Falathrim, Celeborn, a Lathrim, his wife Galadriel, a Noldor, their high king Gilgalad, Elrond Half-Elven, and all the peoples belonging to those lords. Many then went back further east again, merging with those Nandor who had settled in the Vales of the Anduin as the Sylvan Elves, or Wood Elves, already among whom there were also some Avari. As such, this was something of a long-lost family reunion, with the Sindar, Nandor, Laquendi, and those Avari all descending from the Lindar. From this came two elven peoples that we know, the Galadrim and the Elves of Mirkwood. Taking the Mirkwood elves first, in addition to the Lyquendi, Orifer, the father of Thranduil and grandfather of Legolas, brought a handful of Sindar with him to Mirkwood, with the Sylvan elves there taking him as their king. The Sindar in return became entirely assimilated into the Sylvan people, adopting their culture and language wholesale. This is why Legolas sometimes refers to himself as a Sindar elf and sometimes as a Sylvan elf. He's also a wood elf and a grey elf, a Moriquendi but not an Avari, even though some Avari are now elves of Mirkwood like him. You can say something similar about the Sylvan elves living on the eastern side of the Anduin in Lothlorien, who are known as the Galadrim, tree people. In the Second and Third Ages, Noldor and Sindar migrated through Moria to mingle with the Galadrim, whose culture began to be influenced by the newcomers. Like their kin in Mirkwood, they took for their king a Sindar elf, Amdir, and after his son Amroth was lost, rule of the Galadrim was taken up by Galadriel and Celeborn, a Noldor and a Sindar. Following the fall of Eregion, many more Noldor fled through Moria to Lorien, further changing the demographic composition of the Galadrim. Yes, there are lots of different names for the different kinds of elves, but the crucial point here is that in the end, it didn't matter. They all came back together in places like Mirkwood and Lothlorien, and just became elves, Quendi, once more. This echoes, consciously or unconsciously, what Tolkien was trying to do at a meta level in creating a mythology for England. The idea of the three original tribes called to cross the water westwards, a motif repeated with the three houses of men and the three clans of hobbits, mythically foreshadowed the three tribes of Angles, Saxons and Jutes, who migrated from the continent westwards across the North Sea to Britain in real-world British history. With the Light and Dark Elves, Tolkien borrowed elements from other northern mythologies that the early Anglo-Saxons might have had as part of their own. With those dwelling across enchanted seas, within elusive forests and in caves beneath the earth, we see something of the fairies found in the Celtic Otherworld, albeit the true tradition of the fairies, of which the Irish and the Welsh tell only garbled things, as Tolkien phrased it in an early version of his Legendarium. In our real-world Britain, the tribes multiplied and migrations continued, Norse, Norman, and so on into our present time until modern Britain was formed, where ethnicities and legends and histories blurred, formed, and reformed. Tolkien's Elves of Middle-earth echo that crucible. That's why it feels so real, because messiness and complexity such as that that Tolkien created with his elves are part of personal identity, a reflection of where we come from and where we stand now. If you'd like more videos about Tolkien's amazing world, please click on the link on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel, the best way to do that is by clicking on the link to Patreon on the right of your screen.
that's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.